Yes, yeah, so the talk, basically, initially, I thought I would spend maybe about equal amounts of time on quantitative MRI and spectroscopy looking at prostate cancer and then quantification of metabolites in the brain. But probably most of the talk today will be on prostate cancer. So let me start uh, overview and motivation for this whole work. Quantitative uh, magnetic resonance imaging uh, and spectroscopy and quantification of biomarkers is basically important because biomarkers give us important information about both normal function of organs and tissue and also about disease states. So it can be a useful diagnostic tool for early detection and staging for many diseases from cancer to dementia. Now, of course, that raises a question, though, what are useful biomarkers and how can we quantify them? Now, again, biomarkers can be many things. Uh, they're chemical biomarkers in the blood. Uh, basically, you have many different technologies. So biomarkers is a very broad term, but our main focus is on magnetic resonance imaging and spectroscopy. So we are mainly interested in biomarkers that are accessible via MRI and MRS. For instance, there could be relaxation properties of tissue T1, T2, diffusion properties, ADC, kurtosis, um, with applications, diffusion tensor imaging, the chemical composition, which is accessible via MR spectroscopy or perfusion imaging and uptake of contrast agents and, and so forth. So there are many, many different biomarkers that are potentially accessible using magnetic resonance imaging and spectroscopy. But of course, there are others uh, like um, elastic properties that are more easily accessible with other modalities such as ultrasound. Um, and of course, there's many chemical biomarkers in the blood that are not necessarily accessible by MRI and MRS. So the topics for today will be mainly multi-parametric MRI for prostate cancer detection. And in the second part, I'll say a bit about quantification of neurotransmitters using MR spectroscopy. So most of you probably have no idea about prostate cancer, prostate cancer diagnosis. So let me start with a few facts. This is literally from Google, so I can vouch that it's correct. But prostate cancer is one of the most common cancers in the world. In the UK, Google said there is about 50,000 diagnoses per year and over 10,000 people a year actually die as a result of prostate cancer. Now, early detection and treatment, which, as with most uh, cancers, give you the best outcome. But you need to be very careful with prostate cancer because many cancers, many older people will develop uh, precancerous lesions or non-aggressive cancers and over-treatment of minor cancers can also problematic, be problematic and result in poor patient outcomes. For instance, you may have radical chemical treatment or even surgery uh, for people who don't need that surgery. Let's say if they're in their 70s and they have a slow growing non-aggressive cancer, the likelihood that the cancer will kill them is very small. They're most likely going to die of something else. And in some cases, overly aggressive treatment can actually do more harm than good. So the question is, how do you early on identify cancers that are aggressive and need treatment? Uh, so there are a number of diagnostic techniques that are currently used. Usually the uh, first kind of uh, point of call would be blood tests because blood tests are relatively cheap and easy to do. You just need a blood sample. Uh, and most of the blood tests are based on some variation of detecting prostate-specific antigen or PSA. The problem with blood tests is their limited sensitivity and specificity. So we can get both false positives and false negatives. And our preliminary analysis basically suggests that our results for the people referred for imaging uh, don't correlate very well with the prostate-specific antigen uh, tests. But again, there are also different tests that often give you different results. So the next um, a stage if someone has symptoms and their blood tests maybe suggest they have potentially raised levels of PSA would often be uh, invasive uh, techniques such as a digital rectal exam which is highly unpleasant also it's costly you need very highly trained staff and that there are certain risks involved and uh, you can still miss small cancers with uh, digital exams um, and then the other invasive technique would be biopsy which could either be transparent or truss-guided. Truss is um, 
is transrectal ultrasound guided uh, biopsy. So basically a biopsy involves sticking a needle in and removing a small amount of tissue so you can then analyze the tissue for cancerous changes more or less. Now all of these are unpleasant and invasive. So imaging based techniques are generally preferred. Now the most common technique which is the cheapest, not necessarily the most, uh, the best though is transrectal ultrasound. You can see there are two problems there. It's generally unpleasant um, and uh, the second problem, ultrasound does not give you very high resolution images. So it can be used, for instance, to guide biopsies, but it will not typically be used to actually diagnose a cancer because by the time the cancer shows up on the ultrasound, it probably is pretty obvious. So uh, the next stage would be computed tomography. Computed tomography is very common. It's generally used for treatment, uh, like as a, pre a prerequisite for treatment planning, and it's uh, relatively fast and cheap but the problem with computed tomography is you don't have very good soft tissue contrast uh, so it's kind of useful to maybe delineate the prostate to kind of understand whether the general anatomy but it's very difficult to detect cancers especially in the early stage using computed tomography um, another technique would be positron emission tomography uh, that can be more useful for detecting cancers but again it re involves radio tracers and it's also quite expensive Perhaps the most useful and, and versatile technique is magnetic resonance imaging because magnetic resonance imaging gives you access to a wide range of biomarkers and has excellent soft tissue contrast, as we shall see in a minute. So our work uh, in this area has been mainly looking at um, existing data sets that we have in our clinical imaging unit and retrospectively analyzing the data, basically to tr trying to quantify biomarkers. So we have a cohort of 300 to 400 patients that over a period of several years had scans uh, at the imaging unit. And all of these patients were referred to for imaging because they were suspected of having possibly early stage prostate cancer. So basically, um, they, they were not confirmed cancers. They were generally not um, advanced cancers there was just a suspicion they might have prostate cancer. Um, and the, so our aims in uh, doing this retrospective analysis would be ultimately the grand aim would be to develop intelligent algorithms for early detection of prostate cancer, accurate diagnosis, and also for active surveillance. So sometimes people will have um, like maybe an early stage cancer that doesn't appear uh, aggressive. And then, as, as I said, overtreatment can be problematic. So some uh, something that is actively uh, being done now is active surveillance, which could involve repeatedly, like you, you scan the per person, you monitor them, if their symptoms don't progress, maybe you just scan them once a year and see if there is any changes. I think that might be a much better protocol for treating non-aggressive cancers. But of course, that relies on active surveillance, relies on our ability to accurately diagnose the cancer and make an ac accurate prognosis of whether or not uh, like a small and uh, cancer is likely to progress, become aggressive and kill the patient, uh, basically. So the multi-parametric MRI protocol that is used um, initially consisted of four components. Um, the main uh, stay of virtually all MR imaging are T2 weighted images. Um, the T2 weighted images uh, are popular because they provide high resolution anatomical images. They give you generally very good soft tissue contrast and cancerous lesions often show up in the T2 weighted images because they tend to have lower T2 and lower T2 means they appear darker in the T2 weighted images. The second component that is commonly part of a multi-parametric MRI uh, protocol uh, for prostate cancer would be diffusion weighted images and apparent diffusion coefficient maps, so ADC maps. And uh, diffusion weighted images are mainly useful because they give us information about tissue microstructure. So in a way it allows us to detect changes in, cell in cellularity. Um, so T2-weighted images give us a pretty good resolution um, on sometimes a sub-millimeter 
um, level, uh, but we can't detect microstructure. You know, on a cellular level, we can't see the cells in an MRI image, but diffusion allows us to indirectly probe the dish tissue microstructure. So, for instance, if you have a dense tumor, like a solid tumor, you often find there is more tissue boundaries, and so uh, the apparent diffusion coefficients for the wider molecules in the the tissue are lower than for normal tissue. So that will correspond to a low signal at high B values. Uh, but there are problems with the diffusion weighted images because when you apply high B values in general, signal to noise uh, basically is often a problem. Also, in order to be able to do the scans uh, at a reasonable speed, just because you need to do images for various different B values, like you can use fast position protocols, and that often leads to readout distortion. So there are a number of challenges here. Um, the third component that is part of many multi-parametric MRI protocols is dynamic contrast enhanced images. This is a type of perfusion imaging that uses contrast agents, and it's used particular uh, to map out the uptake of contrast agent, and it's, it can be useful to um, as a, as a biomarker for vascularization. Uh, so one um, reason people like perfusion imaging is, for instance, in many tumors, especially aggressive tumors, you have something called neovascularization. When the tumor grows fast, it needs access to blood and nutrients, so it forms new blood vessels. And these new blood vessels are usually, they're often imperfect and they're very leaky. So when you have a lot of neovascularization and these imperfect leaky blood vessels, in a perfusion scan, you will get contrast agent leaking into the, the interstitial spaces, I think, between the cells, and that will show up on a dynamic contrast enhanced scan in changes in contrast. These contrast agents basically, they, as the name suggests, they modify the image contrast, and the more uptake of the contrast agent you have, the larger the changes in image contrast. And I hope I show you an example in a minute. Uh, so these perfusion scans can be useful, but there are a number of safety issues. And obviously, they add additional costs because contrast agents basically require medical supervision. The contrast agents, of course, also have a cost associated with, with, with them. Contrast agents been to use, have been used for a very long time. Most are based on gadolinium. And they've been considered safe until a few years ago when people realized that the contrast agents actually can occasionally um, leak into, they, they can break free from their little cages, and then the gadolinium ion can cross the blood-brain barrier, for instance, and can accumulate in the brain, which is, of course, very bad because gadolinium is a toxic heavy metal. So when these molecules break apart, they can be dangerous. So dynamic contrast enhanced uh, imaging is no longer as popular, and I don't think it should be probably your first point of call. And then the final modality that is sometimes used is spectroscopy. Spectroscopy, as I said, can be very useful to detect, the, uh, to, um, to learn about the chemical composition of, in, of tissue. In particular, we can detect, for instance, imbalances in chemical biomarkers, uh, including biomarkers for prostate cancer. Uh, but there are a number of issues with spectroscopy. Spectroscopy scans tend to be much more complex and time consuming. It is incredibly important to set the protocol up carefully and everything needs to be calibrated perfectly. And if it isn't, you end up with very poor data quality uh, and it's questionable whether you can extract any useful biomarker information. I'll show you an example. So, so our objectives basically here, where we would like to identify the best biomarkers and the best way to quantify them. And then obviously, basically, once you've identified which biomarkers are really useful for diagnosis, you want to optimize the MR protocols for early stage prostate cancer, so that rather than doing just every modality, you know, just, just do every possible scan, you optimize the scan so you scan can provide the scans more cost effectively uh, to more patients. So that's very, it's very important because if you do all of these different modalities, like on a single scan, single patient can take up to an hour. And obviously that means you have a limited throughput and 
we have long waiting lists, so there's a certain trade-off here. And it, optimizing the protocols is really important. And then mainly for us is to develop algorithms that allow us to quantify, identify and quantify biomarkers that could be used for, for cancer staging and active surveillance. Now, the challenges are, are many, but um, one main challenge for us is the available data. So mainly we have a lot of multi-parametric MRI data, but we don't have other data in, in many cases at the moment uh, to, to um, correlate the data with, such as biopsies or clinical outcome data. This is something that I'm really hoping that we could get anonymized clinical outcome data so we could check if we look at a patient uh, where that was scanned a few years ago and we have an algorithm that that basically assesses how likely this cancer is to progress, you know, and, and become and how aggressive it is. It would be very useful to have patients, you know, five years later, did, have, did the patient develop aggressive cancer? What treatment did they need? Or maybe did they die? Or, you know, they're just fine, just because that, that would be very important to validate the results. And currently, this is a big problem. And uh, also, uh, we have limited clinical input that we need to train algorithms for registration, segmentation, identification of biomarkers, because clinicians are very, very busy. So you really need to think hard how you can, uh, like, get by with very little input. So let me t tell you a little bit about the MP MRI scan and analysis protocol. So as I said, we got four different modalities. The first modality we produces T2 weighted images. Um, uh, for the T2 weighted images, we used a sort of rapid uh, turbo spin echo sequence. It's a standard vendor supplied sequence with a spine and pelvic coil. We have 30 slices. Um, standard parameters as per PIRAT's recommendation. For the diffusion weighted imaging, we use the vendor supply epidiffusion sequence. Again, the vendor here, all the scans were done on a Siemens a Sky Rattery Tesla. Uh, so these are all Siemens sequences. Again, spine and pelvic coil, four B values between zero and 1000. Now, I said with the epidiffusion sequence, we do have some issues with distortion. Uh, for the perfusion scans or dynamic contrast enhanced scans, uh, use a 3D T1 weighted gradient echo against spine and pelvic, pelvic coil and a gadolinium based contrast agent. Can't remember exactly what we used, uh, in case you, but I could look it up. And for the spectroscopy, and this is, I think, one of the big problems, we use the 3D CSI chemical shift imaging press sequence with a resolution of 16 by 16 by 16 voxels. And again, just a spine and pelvic coil, no endorectal coil. And you'll see in a minute why this is a very poor choice. Um, so once we, uh, so the patient comes in, they're referred to basically for, for the scan. They have all these different scans. And then before we can analyze anything, the first really important thing is we need manual delineation data. It is still not so easy uh, for algorithms to automatically detect the prostate and in particular segmented in different like uh, regions. Uh, now here, if you look at the, I don't know if you can see my cursor, if you look at the right image in this panel, this shows you one slice of a typical T2 weighted image. You can see there's actually good tissue contrast, but this is an abdominal slice. I think this is cropped and you can see there's a lot of tissue contrast and you can see there is a prostate here in the center and there's something very suspicious. In this case, that's pretty obvious. But uh, if you look more closely, you can see the prostate, the whole prostate here, and you can see there's a sort of circle in the center. This is a central gland and then a sort of crescent shaped region, which is a peripheral zone. And then you can see the transition zone sort of just up here. And uh, at the moment, there's no algorithm that can reliably really segment these slices. So, it, so what, we're, what we are currently doing, so one of our very 
qualified and um, experienced radiographers is currently looking at all of the data sets and manually delineating uh, these images. Uh, so we have the whole prostate, peripheral zone, central gland, and any kind of suspicious regions. And we have a bit of additional information. Uh, and that's going to be really important basically for to train the algorithms. So at the moment, we haven't got a great deal of training data, but hopefully very soon we'll have a lot more. So once we've acquired all these images and we've done the delineation, and I should probably say that uh, the delineation of these different regions is typically done using the T2 weighted images uh, because these have the best resolution and image contrast. But it, it also be noted that this could potentially cause a bias because we are you're doing the delineation based on this one modality and then map it over using registration and mapping for the other modalities where we often have different resolutions. So that ought to be uh, considered. And then the processing and analysis analysis here involves we have diffusion weighted images for the for those we calculate ABC maps for the spectroscopy we are usually interested in the ratio of citrate over choline plus creatine or we inverted it uh, basically we have choline plus creatine over citrate um, and I'll, I'll explain in a minute why this is a useful biomarker and for the diff perfusion scans, uh, basically we generate dynamic R1 maps. So R1 is a relaxation rate, it's kind of the inverse of T1. If you're not familiar with T1 and T2, T1 and T2 are the um, sort of proton relaxation rates. T1 is the rate at which the protons return to their equilibrium, say from if they're in a transverse plane to their equilibrium state. T2 you could think of as, as a kind of phasing time. Um, so the perfusion scans uh, basically so we generate these dynamic R1 map and, and the main importance is from these dynamic maps we can map out the contrast agent uptake and the contrast agent uptake is a biomarker for neovascularization as I've explained a sort of biomarker and then so after we've done the basic manual processing uh, basically we, we do two things we do a statistical analysis so the first thing we have done is we we looked at um, whether there are statistically significant differences in the different biomarkers for the suspicious regions that have been identified by a qualified radiologist or radiographer with su under supervision. Say if you have suspicious regions here, we can calculate the biomarkers for these regions that are suspicious for prostate cancer. And then we can have, take normal control regions and analyze uh, basically the values to see are there statistically significant differences in those biomarkers market between the normal and the suspicious region and then of course ultimately our goal would be can we extend that so we can automatically identify suspicious regions um, so if I, if, if I give the computer an image, ideally we'd like the computer to analyze the image and flag up uh, basically patients, suspicious regions, say this patient, you know, you have to look at this, here's a region that looks suspicious. Uh, so, so that's ultimately what we'd like to be able to do. So auto classification, we like to be able to train machine learning algorithms to automatically first classify normal and suspicious regions, and then ideally identify the regions, the suspicious regions of interest automatically. Now, you would probably still want a doctor to confirm this, but it would be enormously helpful if an algorithm because you generate a huge amount of data. An algorithm could scan all these images and identify regions that are suspicious. Maybe they have abnormal uh, levels of biomarkers and then just flag these up so the radiologist could just look at those regions and go, yeah, that, that's suspicious, uh, you know, and then grade, um, grade the data. That would probably be enormously helpful, even if it's not completely unsupervised. It would maybe be still supervised. The algorithm flags of regions and then the radiologist would say yes or no. 
And ideally, if one collects more data, hopefully the algorithms would get better at, you know, identifying the suspicious regions. So, as I said, let me explain a little bit how we do the analysis. So, first for the diffusion-weighted imaging, we use a standard diffusion sequence. And basically, I don't uh, for, for the people who know a little bit about MR sequences, uh, so standard diffusion sequence, here you see this is a spin echo type sequence. You've got a 90-degree excitation pulse and you have your 180 degree refocusing pulse and the standard diffusion sequence simply involves applying um, diffusion gradients before and after the refocusing pulse and we can change the magnitude, the width of the gradient and the delay between the gradients and uh, that will basically all of these parameters can be combined in one parameter called the B value which I won't get into now but basically the stronger the diffusion uh, gradients, uh, the, the larger the B values, the greater the effect of diffusion. And let me just explain very briefly the idea. So the idea is that spin echo, that refocusing pulse works perfectly if the spin stay in the same place. But if you apply like a large defacing, a diffusion gradient, it kind of defaces the spins and has a different effect depending on, because the gradient is spatially varying, the effect of the gradient depends on uh, like say a direction in space or like where you are along a certain axis. Now, if, if the molecule doesn't move, then the first gradient will deface the signal. The refocusing pulse inverts basically the spin state, and then the second gradient rephases the signal perfectly, so the two gradients cancel out. But if the molecule moves, then the, two, then the effect of the two gradients don't cancel out. So the more the molecule moves, the more attenuation in the signal uh, you will see because you, you basically get defaced um, and that's uh, the idea of the diffusion imaging. Let me maybe show you how we then construct an ADC map. So what we basically do is we get these images for different B values and the set of B values, a combination of the strengths and the widths of the gradient and the delay. And I'm not going to go into those details. So, the, so, so you can see these uh, diffusion weighted images. They are kind of very blurry. They usually don't have very good signal to noise. And if you just look at an individual diffusion weighted image they're much worse than the ADC, than the t2 weighted images uh, now here they're also really small but here we would have b0 and then b1 and you can see that the signal sort of slowly uh, drops off and now you can choose any point in the image and you got a sequence of images you can simply plot the logarithm of the signal versus a B value and for Gaussian diffusion, uh, basically the, you should have a, you should see exponential decays so on a log linear plot. It would be like a straight line and the slope of this line is the ADC value. And then of course you can calculate the slope of the line for every point in the image and then uh, plot this as an image itself. This is known as the ADC map. So the slope is the apparent diffusion coefficient. You can determine it for every voxel and then uh, that you have an image basically, which is known as the ADC map. The ADC maps are usually the most useful part. Like uh, we usually don't use a, the raw images, the fusion rated images very much. So here you see uh, like some actual data. This is an, like a slightly larger image of a diffusion map, still kind of blurry. Then we can map sort of, we can choose different regions. In this case, there's small little regions we've chosen. And uh, here we basically look at the we have a sequence of these, uh, we have the same slice as in patient, but a sequence of the images. And then for these different colored regions, basically we can work out the signal and we can work at the variation of the signal. And you can see in this case, the signal is actually a very nice straight line. The points lie on a straight line and the slope here is fairly consistent. So mostly in, despite the fact that we use a fairly poor uh, epidiffusion sequence. We actually have fairly good uh, SNR, and as you can see here, the linear fit on the log linear plot, uh, the signal versus the B value, pretty good. Um, and we do actually see from this when we do the analysis, 
when we look at normal regions and suspicious regions, we we generally see that the ADC is lower for prostate cancer. So people with prostate cancer, be, uh, basically, the, the cancerous regions tend to have a lower ADC as so the slope becomes more flat. But here you can see for normal patient, all of these are kind of normal regions, the slope is fairly consistent. But uh, what we what we don't see is actually any evidence of kurtosis or non-Gaussian diffusion, which is also a potential biomarker for cancer, but we don't have high enough B values uh, to, to basically be able to say whether we, we don't see kurtosis, so we, we cannot use that biomarker in our data. Uh, so the diffusion data is pretty good, and in most cases, and, and all of our protocols will use the ADC maps as, um, like, as a biomarker for the analysis. Then the next thing, the spectroscopy data. The spectroscopy data, well, not so much. So if, when it comes to spectroscopy, one biomarker for prostate cancer that has been proposed is a ratio of citrate versus creatine and choline. Um, or just choline, but very often you take creatine and choline. And the the you can you can take the ratio of either way, citrate over creatine, choline, or the other way around, whichever way you prefer. And the idea is that in a healthy prostate, usually you have a high level of citrate. So the ratio of citrate over creatine and choline uh, would be um, would be fairly high. But in, in patients that have prostate cancer, usually uh, the choline is elevated and the citrate levels go down. So you expect that ratio to be a decrease for prostate. Now, I think I plotted it in the opposite way. So in this case of citrate, uh, if you put citrate in the denominator, then I should have said it actually increases. You can do it either way. Uh, now, the problem is we do not, our results are not consistent with the theory. And we, the spectra, we have very, very messy. And, and I'll maybe I'll, I'll just show you the spectra. And this basically shows you one big pitfall with spectroscopy. So here you can see this is a whole spectrum. And here, this is a Siemens software. You can see the image slices in the voxel and stuff. And you can see the software basically finds peak for creatine, choline, and citrate, and it quantifies those peaks. Except you can see from the spectrum that this is probably garbage because you can see there's virtually no signal here. And there's a gigantic water peak. The water suppression has almost completely failed here. Uh, so this is probably just uh, within the noise. This is almost within the noise floor. And that usually is a result of poor shimming. Often it's very difficult to get the frequency to be resonant because uh, there's the, the, the off resonance effects. So water suppression, when you have poor shimming, the frequency may not be resonant for all sorts of reasons. Uh, then water suppression fails. You end up with noisy spectra and the biomarker quantification becomes unreliable. But as I said, you have to be careful because the automated, the software will pretty much fit uh, It'll give you a fit and it'll give you value for all of these metabolites. You just cannot necessarily rely on the values. So all we've done here, this is just a table for a couple of patients. Um, without suspected malignancy, we looked at the mean value for two different regions of four. I think a couple of different regions that were obviously healthy regions, there was no suspected mal malignancy. Uh, and we just changed the processing protocol pipeline, the way we process the spectra. And you look at the same patients, the same spectrum, you can get vastly different. In this case here, you see, you see vastly different results for both the mean and the standard deviations are huge. So yes, you will always get a fit, but basically the differences are huge, I would say. Um, um, this you might as well read the tea leaves and also for patients with suspected malignancy we looked at the mean values for the malignant for suspicious for cancer when I say malignancy I mean regions that are suspicious for cancer versus healthy tissue um, the values are also all over the place in some cases the, the values for the malignant regions are lower, and in fact, they should be higher because we looked at cho choline plus creatine over citrate. So when citrate goes down, uh, the ratio would increase. Sometimes people look at inverted and then 
So, so uh, basically, uh, what we found is a spectra of rubbish, and we can get any result we want simply by changing the processing uh, pipeline for the spectra. So, effectively, uh, the data is not useful. Now, part of the reason is um, none of these spectras were done using an endorectal coil, and I think a minimum prerequisite for doing prostate spectroscopy would be using an endorectal coil. Also, using a 3D CSI sequence is probably a terrible idea because we get a lot of spectra but mostly they are noise so I like to say we probably have the largest collection of noise spectra of prostate uh, in the world that's probably not true but we have a lot of them so the spectroscopy data we early on decided it wasn't useful I'm not saying that spectroscopy couldn't be useful for prostate cancer it might be a very useful tool if it was reliable to because chemical changes such as lower uh, citrate levels often precede uh, visible tumor. So before, maybe before you have a large big cancer, there may be chemical changes. And if you could detect these chemical changes early on, perhaps you could actually, uh, you know, there, there's some interventions that you could make so the patient will not develop cancer. Uh, but clearly uh, the data is not good enough to do anything with it. Then for the perfusion scan, so this is basically um, an R1 map. If you don't know exactly what an R1 map is, it's a bit like the ABC map. Uh, and I don't want to bore you with a mask, but you can see here's a prostate in the center actually stands out. It is very dark initially before you inject the contrast agent. And here the very bright areas are probably mostly fat. I think these are bone. So you can actually see the prostate quite clearly. But watch what happens when I actually like uh, when I play this video. So basically what we have, this is before any contrast agent was injected. And then after like a few seconds, we inject the contrast agent and then this will light up bright red uh, because the prostate uh, tends to take up uh, contrast in general, while most of the other things, there will be just maybe some random fluctuations. But sometimes you get very high, you get bright spots where contrast agent uptake is much higher. Now let's see, can I play this? Is it play? Oh yeah, I think it does. You can see how it gets very bright very quickly. And then it stays basically constant. So when you inject a contrast agent, it, gets, it lights up, and then it stays it stays bright for quite a while. And then slowly, usually the contrast agent will be washed out. You'll get some washout, and then you get darker again, like a little bit. Um, and now what you can do is you can basically generate these what I call like dynamic maps, up to like R1 maps. And now here, for instance, you can see there's like some dark region, which could be an artifact, but it could also be significant. Now, I suspect because this is at the very boundary that this is an artifact, but you can see, like when you looked at the image of the prostate, you couldn't see very much variation. But when you look at the uptake map, there's actually darker and brighter regions. So what we do to quantify the uptake in this is now, again, this is a simplified procedure. Typically, the uptake curve looks like this. Before you inject contrast agent, you have a baseline R1 value, say, say it's 20 uh, in arbitrary units. Obviously, they're not arbitrary, but they're, they're in hertz, typically. You have a baseline R1. Then you inject a contrast agent. You have a rapid change, as you could see. It lights up very quickly. And then usually it either stays constant or slowly washes out. Sometimes there's uh, still some slow uptake, so there there could be uh, different scenarios. And uh, but basically you have constant baseline, rapid uptake, and then either slow continuous uptake, wash out, or it stays constant. And uh, then you could also try to s quantify the speed of the, of the uptake here with this A parameter. So the parameter of Y0 in our model is a baseline R1. The, uh, the time basically of the uptake usually takes a midpoint. Uh, basically, this is, uh, and we can correlate that time uh, to the time when the contrast agent was injected. This is usually like, uh, it's a few seconds after we see the uptake. The magnitude of the uptake would be like this delta y. And then we have curve types, whether it's this constant, we see a washout, or we see uh, continued uptake. Um, here you see some actual fits for normal and suspicious regions. 
and you can actually see there are some differences. Now, the first thing you should see, you can see the different curve types. Here we see continuous uptake, sort of, but this is a type A curve. Here you see the washout curve, a type C curve. And here you have basically a small amount of uptake and it stays flat. So we see all these different curve types and we can pretty much fit them all with, with a model, uh, basically. So, so, so this is our own model. This is a simplified version. And we think this is actually pretty good because it's much simpler than um, doing the full analysis. Now, what you can see just in these two examples, and we've got lots more, is here you can actually see. So the first, when you look at the curve type, you have all different curve types. And for the for the normal regions, you can you. you so one theory was that for the uh, um, malignant regions, you will see rapid uptake followed by washout that would be highly suspicious but you can see here you see rapid uptake followed by continuous uptake so you see all these different scenarios so i think the curve type is not actually a useful biomarker but the magnitude of the uptake can be i mean when you look at the normal regions versus the suspicious region there is much more uptake in the suspicious region it tends to also be steeper although we didn't find statistically significant correlation between the speed of the uptake in the normal and suspicious regions, but mainly it's because you can see we have only a few data points. So actually the um, speed of the uptake, this A parameter, the estimation is very uncertain because we do not have a high enough time resolution because the image just take a finite amount of time to acquire. So that limits the the time resolution we get. So that's the perfusion scans, but as I said here, when we look at the normal and suspicious region, we can look at the baseline R1, the magnitude of change, the magnitude of the, the change in the R1 is, is effectively a proxy for the uh, contrast agent uptake. And then we, we can look at the p-value, we can perform various tests, and we find that the curve type parameter basically is, there's no significant difference between the curve types. Uh, or uptake speeds for normal and suspicious region, but we did find statistically significant differences in the baseline R1 and the magnitude of change, the delta R1, which is a proxy for the uptake of the contrast agent. Um, so, so that's basically was our initial analysis of the different modalities. So then the next step was basically, so we basically wanted to see which biomarkers we should look at. And then the next step would be to do a manual statistical analysis. So we split the patient into healthy controls and those that have suspicious cancerous regions in the peripheral zone identified by a radiologist. And then in this case, we user delineated the whole prostate, the central plant and the peripheral zone. And at the moment, we've this was done by a student with relatively little medical uh, expertise, and we've only got a small data set. But I am hoping that very soon we will have uh, expert delineations, basically for much larger uh, class of patients. So hopefully, we will have enough data to validate those preliminary results. So then, so we have delineates of prostate, we have the normal and suspicious regions, and then the first thing we did was basically histogram analysis. Uh, for the whole prostate, the central gland, and the peripheral zone. And so um, the blue um, distribution is a distribution of values for the whole prostate. And then uh, basically we compare with the values for normal and suspicious regions as identified by the radiologist for this particular patient. And you can see when we take the whole prostate, it's kind of we can see that the normal and suspicious regions, you can actually sort of differentiate them, but how would you figure, but, but, but there's a lot of overlap. Let me just summarize. The problem is when you when you look at the whole prostate, you see it's a very non-Gaussian distribution because you actually have these two different zones, the central gland and the peripheral zone, and the values and the, the, the distribution of values in the central gland is much lower than for the peripheral zone. In particular, the normal values in the central gland overlap with the suspicious values in the peripheral zone. So if you do an analysis on the whole prostate, it's very difficult to differentiate 
differentiate these regions. But if you have a delineation of, the, if you can differentiate the different regions, we should be able to pick out uh, the normal and suspicious regions. And actually, so as I said, we looked at a handful of cases. So here, these were the, delinea the anatomical delineations uh, for the prostate, so central gland, peripheral zone. This was a normal control. And then here we again, uh, whole prostate, peripheral zone, this, this crescent shaped area. Then there's a central gland. And here we have, um, I think the red ones are suspicious. And in a normal control region, we often try to make some contralateral. So here, this looks suspicious. Then this is a contralateral normal control region. And then basically what we did is we did the histogram analysis. Based on the histogram analysis, we tried to find thresholds. We did threshold mapping. And this is very preliminary data. Basically what it suggests is, so the, the pink regions are what we identify as normal. And the non-pink regions here would be the ones that might be suspicious. And the red delineations are the regions that are identified as suspicious by the uh, radiologist. So you can see our uh, threshold basically identifies more as suspicious. Uh, than the radiologist would be, but all of the suspicious regions are sort of covered. So we're hoping that if you could improve this, you could uh, probably identify the uh, differentiate normal from suspicious region. Now, as I said, at the moment, this is very preliminary and we would really, we really need more data. Uh, and then, of course, we would like to automate this. And this is where machine learning comes in. So let me just wrap this up with a machine learning. So, so far, we've only got some preliminary results uh, based basically only on classification. So ideally, uh, we would like to automatically identify the region, but this is just um, like a classification exercise. So uh, the algorithms provided with little cutouts of, of the prostate, normal regions and suspicious regions, and it has to decide is that little region we're looking at is normal or suspicious. We can, we can define the accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity. Uh, this is Asmal's uh, work. Uh, so he's looked at different types of CNN, different network types, and using different modalities. Uh, can we differentiate normal and suspicious regions? So again, we get the highest accuracy for the T2-weighted images, but all of these actually have a fairly high accuracy where the algorithm seems to be able to distinguish normal from suspicious region. Again, that's just we give it some regions to look at and it's just a classification exercise. It is not yet uh, a case of the algorithm has to identify the suspicious regions automatically. And then, of course, uh, so here we looked at the individual modalities and different network types. And then Asmal has also looked at combining the modalities. And so far, we've only looked at T2 weighted images and ADC. And sometimes there's another biomarker is a high B value image. Uh, based on our analysis, we don't usually use a high B value image uh, as a biomarker because it, it seems to not provide any additional information to the ADC. And that also seems to uh, be consistent here, but we actually get pretty high um, accuracy and, and also sensitivity and specificity. So I think there is hope that if we had more data, more training data, we might be able to do the classification and hopefully we could use some kind of statistical analysis and, and machine learning to identify sets of biomarkers that would eventually allow us to automatically identify regions in the prostate that are suspicious for the radiologist uh, to evaluate. So that's roughly where we are now. I hope this was somewhat coherent.